Good morning. Beautiful spirit here this morning. My name is Ann Corley. We have been here, I my, and my husband, who I lost three years ago, but it's still we. <laughs> we have came, we came to this church when it was started, first day, been here ever since. And we started in a school building. And to see all the progress that God has brought down the pike all these years, we're just so grateful and grateful to still be here and able to feel his presence in this place. My, um, my husband and I were, uh, had a, a ministry called Christian Cowboys. I'm thoroughly modern Millie, but God has a sense of humor. <laughs> anyway, when, uh, when we first came here, there was no music for the church, so Donna and I were it. He with his guitar, and he had taught me to play the upright bass, so that's all you had for a while. But we made it happen, then invited a friend to come and play the piano for us because we knew that, uh, you know, that guitar and upright bass was going to wear out here pretty quick. Anyway, we have been blessed to be, uh, to have had a life that has honored God through the years. And ministering to cowboys and people that, the people we ministered to anyway, were seldom at their home churches, even if they had one. So I just want to emphasize this morning after experiencing that and knowing the impact of having a home church and being regularly in attendance means so much in your Christian growth. So I encourage you all, any, any time you can be there, and that really should be most of the time unless you have a job that takes you away, but I encourage you to be in the house of God at every possible opportunity. We're reading this morning from 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 9, Saul's jealousy of David. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry. And this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me, they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. May the Lord bless his word. I'm sorry, I failed to ask you to stand for the reading of the word. <laughs> oh, <you're fine. laughs> hey guys, it's been you're a long time since I've <laughs> t- even talked through a microphone. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Ed. Fantastic. So uh, what a blessed, rich church we are. Hey, Amen. speaking yes. of, of blessed. 64 years of marriage between Ron and Doris. Doris, God bless you. Ron, congratulations. This is really all. And you guys are such a beautiful testimony to to faithfulness and uh, continuing, as as even Ann described, what it is, what it looks like to serve the Lord. So, together. Hey, uh, Today's message, um, I posted on, the, on, on Facebook this morning, we approach it with, uh, with a unique blend of dread and incredible amount of anticipation and excitement. And I don't, I don't know uh, how common that is among our, our messages, but this one is uniquely that. Today's message is entitled, uh, The Danger... What's wrong? What's this? Uh, well, my... my sh- my shoe slid down. Sorry, did you slid down the chair? Yeah, sorry about that. Sound effects for me. That's I guess good. I, All right. Yeah. So, sorry. the the danger of wearing heels. You know, what? Um, it's so right. <laughs> the danger of a throne room without a throne. And this was actually inspired from our recent trip to Germany. So I get to show a couple pictures. I've been wanting to do this. So uh, one of the one of our little excursions along the trip was uh, to the Bavarian castle that probably many of you would know, uh, Neuschwanstein. And this was an amazing castle. Jen 
could, uh, and the boys could explain the history probably much better, but I just thought it was just cool, bottom line. And uh, how, how many are familiar with this one, right? This is where Mickey and Mouse lives. and like uh, the Sleeping lives. Beauty Castle, yeah. <laughs> Who? Like the I, sleeping, and I thought it was I'm, Mickey Mouse that lived there. I, All maybe. Right. So actually it was <laughs> King Ludwig II, and uh, the dude was, well, there was all sorts of issues with him, but bottom line, when he went to, to build this castle, it was an edifice really to himself, which is uh, ultimately a lot what happened with a lot of those castles during that time. And uh, it built, I mean, this, this is actually was designed for 200 rooms. And uh, I think what we found, uh, I think only 14 of the rooms are, because they never got finished. You never really got to experience That's it. Right. Long, long story attached, but bottom line, it was beautiful. It was beautiful, just majestic, sitting in the castle there. And, uh, you know, so we, we got to, to go up, and it's this long, long walk to get all the way up there. And we finally get up there, and, and uh, there's this huge queue of, of trying to get in. How many people did we find out that go through there? Um, uh, 11,000 a day. I think they can handle 11,000 Almost 11,000 people. Yeah. And so you were just queued in to go through. It's like a money-making machine. Like, ah, why can't we figure that out? And uh, so... <laughs> You're, they're just, they take your money, you get to, and you just, you're just like cattle, you, you go through, and there's these uh, little, little torrents, whatever, the little spiral staircase, and you go in, it's kind of, it's, it, it is, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's beautiful. Um, so we got to do it as a family, and uh, uh, so we're going up there, beautiful, uh, beautiful scenery uh, that you could see from like, like overlooking there, isn't that gorgeous? I'm like, yeah. oh, just so cool, it's like you're standing there, and you're just imagining, I am King Ludwig. And uh, so, of course, we had to take pictures, and I always like taking these selfie pictures, which I did not get this approved by boys before we did this. But anyways, um, so, but anyways, we're, we're going through the castle and, and uh, find, you know, the beauty of all the different rooms. There's great, again, lots of backstory. But we go into this one room, which was the throne room. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Like, all the gold and everything is just like, yeah. wow. I think the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call that? Chandelier thing was, is uh, uh, 13 feet high and like this big, amazing throne room. And you walk in and there's like this, this moment, right? And, uh, and then the, the little tour person describes the uniqueness of this, because King Ludwig never got to actually reside there. He never got to actually put his throne in the throne room. And so it's a, now, out of millions of people that have come through there over these years, yeah. it's now simply people looking at a throne room without a throne. And here's where we're going with that today. There is an incredible danger when we have a throne room of our heart and there's not a king seated firmly at the center of that heart. And in fact, as we're going to talk about, we've talked about all the different kings and throughout this series we're going to, mm -hmm. Saul in particular, right, That's right. Is, is one that Scripture notes is absolutely a man who had a throne room, like amazing. We'll talk about that in a second. But there was no throne in his heart. The throne of God was, was, was vacant. The man really right. was incredibly insecure and empty on the inside. That's right. This morning we're talking about our, the source of our security. And of course that means that we're going to have to talk about the inverse of that, and that is insecurity. And probably we all know exactly what that feels like, right? I don't need to stand up here and give you a definition of what it feels like to be insecure, to feel unstable, possibly unworthy, a sense of lack, that there's something that's missing in me that makes me feel like I'm just empty and not enough. And this is a hard topic, and we, we talked about this already, that it, because insecurity is a common false ruler that we've been talking about, the different types of rulers that we can have in our lives. And it's a false one, and it's common, but it's especially difficult because typically it's connected to pain. Typically, the often. things that I am insecure about often come from a place of, of difficulty and pain in my life. Yeah. 
If I forget my God-given dignity and I try to derive worth and significance from something or someone else, I'm gonna be left feeling pretty unstable in my life. And we know that insecurity causes huge problems inside relationships. And the thing about it is that we're built to need security. We're, we're not built to go it alone. God absolutely designed us to need security. I mean, when we think about little babies, thank you for bringing Mateo up here. I just love to see his little face. <laughs> when we think about babies, right, they, they come to the world completely defenseless. They are completely reliant upon their caregivers to give them what they need, right? Food, yeah. shelter, right. water, every, everything. Right. We're vulnerable. So we need security, we need it. It's not a weakness to desire that. That's a good thing. But sometimes when we're insecure, we, strain, we, we strive to gain security in faulty ways, like ways that are not gonna do it. Like the, as you said, having a throne room with no throne. So we're gonna ask the question this morning, what is the source of my security? So let's, let's go to the text. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, actually it would be really handy if you've got your device or, because there's some things I wanna, we'll, we'll look at some backstory too, but look at the text that Ann uh, wrote, read just a moment ago. I mean, uh, picture this moment, right? I mean, Saul who, and I just remind you real quick, um, y'all, Saul had it all. Like he was, it, 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 he kind of had that rock star look to him. He was tall. He was handsome. We talked about that last week quite a bit. Didn't Tall we? and yeah. handsome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, it, it, and it, at this point, he was identified by God like he's the dude. He's the guy that I chose. And what starts to be unpacked very quickly, according to the account of Scripture, is that we see that this Saul has these character flaws. He, there's a deficiency, and as we'll talk about and see the connection there, the insecurity. But... You have to, you, you real quickly start asking the question, why are you so insecure? Hmm. Like, dude, you've got it going, right? So here's the story. Uh, by this point, David had already killed, help me out, historians, Bible historians, get David had killed Goliath, Goliath all right? And uh, the battle against the Philistines was raging. Keep in mind, Saul was already a, a great warrior himself and had, had uh, been known for his abilities to lead and a man of, uh, of, of being able to lead great armies, the Israelites. Um, interestingly, though, with, with Saul, um, he, early on we start seeing that his, his soul is troubled. There's, there's something going on with Saul. Um, I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned uh, when any of us ignore uh, what's going on in here. Mm. Or parents kind of glossing over uh, a, a, a child's struggles um, or a spouse, however that would look, vice versa. Um, Saul, something's going on. Like, like literally the story is, right, that, that David was, I'll, I'll call it a guitar player. He was kind of like a, a, a Mike French dude or Chris Citrana. He's like, he, he played guitar and he was invited after killing uh, David, after David killed Goliath, that he'd come in and hang out with Saul. And he would, he would calm every time when Saul would feel unrest and troubled soul. David would sit there off to the side, ding, 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 and, and, and play his, his beautiful uh, lyre. Um, and now we see, it kind of advances, the story is that Saul uh, now shows up, gathers, and all of a sudden, it, we, we see this celebration that starts to happen. Just shortly after all the, the Philistines, uh, there were some great battles that David was leading, and when they come back, when, when they come back as, as men of war, they come back, there's this huge celebration that starts to break out. It's among the gals, and they start singing a song. It became almost like a little proverb throughout, throughout kind of Saul's history. In fact, it went on beyond that. It became part of their little, little ditty. And it goes like this. I, I feel like I need a rap beat or something. <laughs> Saul was struck down, right? And uh, it, it goes, Saul has struck down his thousands. Yeah. And David, his ten thousands. And Saul is listening in from his little perch mm -hmm. up there in, on, uh, at... at uh, Nushwan Sun Castle, right? Like he's, <laughs> he's sitting up there and he's hearing all this, these girls singing and dancing. 
And something starts to happen within him. And here's, here's how it's described. He responds, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and me, they've ascribed thousands. And one more, and he starts thinking, he's starting to look towards David. Now keep in mind, David is just doing what David does. Like David's not trying to barge in, he's not building any, any uh, fame for himself, he's just being David. But from Saul's perspective, this insecurity, this void that he was dealing with now starts to fester and he starts fixating on David. In fact, it says, and Saul eyed David from that day forward. And that became for David, for, for Saul, something that grew and developed into almost like a, like a vacuum in his soul that started attracting all sorts of ugliness affected how he led. And here goes the question again. Saul, like if you're talking to Saul, wouldn't you want to ask the question, why do you care so much about what other people think? Well, of course we do. Right? Yeah. Kind of got quiet there. Of course we care what people think, right? The question, really, when we drill it down, why? For Saul, just to remind you, he had the looks, so he clearly already had the chicks, right? He already had all the attention, like there at some point, many, at least for some level of years, they were like, oh, Saul, you're amazing, right? And he, like, he had power. All he had to do was point here right. and here, yeah. and people responded. So like, why do you care so much? What other people saying? Because here's what happens. Saul, Saul's eye, right? was fixated. And this actually is an interesting verse that we want to take note. Saul's eye is on David. And we start getting introduced to a principle that is incredibly in direct contrast with a major theme of Scripture. And that is the fear of man. We start finding it early on. And I'll tell you, and we'll, we'll, we'll unpack this, sweetheart, with it. But, but this becomes a quintessential game changer when we allow what other people are saying to take residence in the throne room of our life, it's a game changer. And for Saul, now he's fixated, right? Fixated on David, who essentially is like, I'm just doing what I do. Yeah. Starts to reveal, right, that Saul's major insecurity is centered around somebody else. His source for the security is centered on something else other than God himself. That's really right. Howard. Yeah. There's always a story, isn't there? There's always a backstory of some sort. And I've thought about that several times over, over the years, how, you know, I'm grateful for the grace that people extend to me, for the idiosyncrasies and all the, the things that I do. And usually for most of us, if there's something that we do that, that is difficult to deal with, there's usually a reason. There's yeah. usually some yeah. kind of genesis that was, that was difficult and hard. So we're going to look back a little bit at Saul's backstory in yeah. 1 Samuel 15. And just to set up this chapter, if you've got your, your Bible or your electronic device, feel free to, to flip to it. But the setting is, is that uh, Samuel has said to, the, to Saul, okay, uh, the Lord has sent me to anoint you, so now there's a battle that the Lord wants you to wage against Amalek. So, you know, go to it. And he had pretty specific instructions of how Saul was meant to handle the armies and the people of Amalek. It was very clear. He knew, he knew what it was supposed to be. Remember last week we talked about another time when Saul just didn't obey. God gave him specific instructions and he just decided, right. no thanks, I'm going to do something different than that, which in that case was nothing. But here in this case, we see some partial obedience. But so... Uh, Samuel, Samuel says, okay, Saul, go, you need to go and wage war against Amalek and then, you know, take care of these things and do it exactly the way that God has told you to do. So then 
Samuel comes back to check up on things, and Saul has sort of obeyed, just partially. And in verse 17 of 1 Samuel 15, Samuel says to Saul, though you are little in your own eyes, wow. are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And he says, and the Lord sent you on a mission. And he's jumped down to verse 19. He says, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? He's like, you're, you're, you've started out well, you are small in your own eyes. You don't think you're all that. You, you are, but God has made you the head of the tribes of Israel. He's anointed you. He yeah. sent you on a mission. And yet, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And Saul basically equivocates for a little bit. And, and Samuel kind of gives him a, you know, a, a strong rebuke of to obey is better than sacrifice in verse 22. But then on verse 24, Saul's heart begins to really reveal itself through his words. And Saul says to Samuel in verse 24 of chapter 15, he says, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people Whoa. and I obeyed their voice. There it is. Not the voice of God. I obeyed their voice mm. because I feared the people. Samuel says to Saul, you know what, this is it. The kingdom is being torn out of your hand because you did not obey the Lord. But Saul's not done. In verse 30, Saul says, okay, yes, I have sinned. You're right, I've sinned. But honor me now in front of the elders of my people and before <laughs> Israel and return with me so that I can bow before the Lord your God. Because they would have these battles and then they'd head on back to Jerusalem and worship the Lord before um, after, afterwards to say thank you for the, for the good victory. But in verse 30, Saul says, yeah, you're okay, yes, fine, I've sinned. I, I, I admit it, I did. But if you could still please just come back with me and honor me in front of all the people so that I can go and do my uh, little religious thing, yeah. right? He's so concerned about the optics. Wow. It's like, God's word, so what? People's voices are far louder than that. Oh, what God wants me to do? No, nope, don't really care about that, but I sure want to have honor in front of people. So revealing. Yeah. And I just, you know, I just need to say this because, and we talk about this every time, <laughs> and that is that before we are here in this space, you know, we need ask the Lord, we purposely ask the Lord to deal with our hearts, you know, <laughs> before we stand up here and say anything about what the, the word says, we need to be dealt with on our own. And I can tell you as a person, I have dealt with profound insecurity for a lot of my life on a lot of ver just various fronts and it's nobody's fault, but the Lord and I are making progress. And, and this is something that we've been journeying together on for a long time. And so this, this rattles me quite a bit, actually, this, this uh, I've, I've noticed of Saul. I've noticed it's way easier to see this issue in someone else. Oh, it sure is, it sure <laughs> yes, is. right? So Saul feared the people. How did, how did Saul enact fear of man or fear of people? He esteemed them too highly. Yeah. In fact, he esteemed them above God. This is, this is huge. Fall, Saul feared the people by esteeming them too highly above the word of God, above whether God gave favor or not. It was really about getting the people's favor and not their disapproval, right? So we see Saul here revealing a disordered loyalty. The fact that his heart is loyal to something other than, right. his, than his God. A disordered loyalty. Yeah. The fear of man, fear of people, is one of the most powerful expressions of insecurity because we're looking for our security, for our filling up and our worth in other people instead of in God, right? The fear of man is an mm. expression of insecurity because we're looking for that in other people instead of in God. And I was thinking about one of the dangers of this. There's, there are many. But the fear of people will eventually warp our sense of reality. Because if, if people, if human beings are my measuring stick, <laughs> you know, people are constantly changing, right? Like, we're constantly in flux. Things are happening and we're growing and changing and, and, and digressing and all these different things. So if somebody else is the measure of what I am, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be stable. Right. But when we think about God, who is changeless, right? He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. What you experience of me right now is what you're going to experience of me in 60 years from now. And that's what I was, you know, millennia ago, right? 
Right. So the only secure measuring stick for our lives, the only right ruler yeah. is our Father God, right? Yeah. We yeah. talked about how the fear of man is a kind of a two-pronged thing. So to just get it boiled down to like a simple definition for our working purposes good. today, Useful. the fear of man is needing their honor, and I mean needing it, like longing for it, and fearing their disapproval. At the same time, those two things can happen at the same time, believe it or not. I can need their honor and I fear their disapproval. Fear people. Yeah, so um, purposely wanted to take a, a few minutes and just lay the groundwork. Is anybody sitting here saying, wow, like I can relate to that? Anybody? Okay, don't raise your hand because that would be like, oh, wait, why wouldn't we raise our hands? It is extraordinary how embedded it is in our culture, in our thoughts about how people think about us. It is, and in fact, everything in consumerism is all about selling and feeding our need to be thought of or looked at as better from clothing to to all of the media and everything that we could identify with, it's all around that. And so we're actually taught that the fear of man is actually the most important thing that we could have. So here, we, we just took some time to, to just, if we can, we're just going to unpack some <laughs> of this. Bit, yeah. Because here's the deal. This is a major part of our personal story. And uh, so I'm, I'm asking that you just bear with us just a little bit. Um, here's what it might look like when the source of our security is not God, and maybe some of us can relate to it, one of them was this, is when healthy correction feels threatening. I, I, I boy, that one, I, you know, and honestly for myself, I, I know I have my, my own struggles in, in the, the insecurity piece, but I, I think, too often it revealed a, the, the pride side related to insecurity. Because if somebody's gonna be critical of me, that means something, maybe I'm not good enough. And I automatically assumed that when I would hear criticism, I would hear it as personal attack. And I look back now in my age and I'm like, you know what, 75% of it. I mean, there were, there were some people that were just well, let's just face it. There really are some people that are just rude. Yeah? And like, just mean. Like, did, you, did that just come out of your mouth? Did you, do you realize how hurtful that is? And you're like, and that person, they're actually looking to destroy you or break you down. But honestly, I, 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 the number I grabbed, 75% of most people being critical. Maybe they, they could have been smarter in how they say it. But honestly, they really just wanted to help me. But my insecurity is like, no, you are a bad person and you're being mean to me and now I'm gonna dwell on that issue and that thought. So any, is that, am I the only person no. in therapy? Okay, all right, I'm the only one. No, no. Good. Or? Or when lack of act for affirmation, when lack of affirmation feels like criticism. And this one was, yeah, all of these I, I took personally. <laughs> I was just dealt with all those. When lack of affirmation feels like criticism, when someone's not quite telling me that I'm doing a good enough job at all times. And, I, and again, these, are, these can be in a, on a sliding scale in our lives. Yeah. There can be a real extreme in how they present. But as I was thinking about this and like what I needed from you when we were first married, Mm. I, God bless you for, <laughs> for staying with me because, well, I don't You're know. Amazing. I needed things from you that you were not equipped to deliver. And, and I, I, you know, I'm just going to say it, and I've said this to the ladies Bible study so many times. It's like, I, I tried to make you an idol in my life. I mm. wanted you to, to run the position of God. And that didn't work well. He's wonderful. He's a great man. I love him. But he's not handsome. equipped. Yeah, handsome, okay, absolutely. But he is just not equipped to be God. And you know what? Not, none of us are, none right? Us are. Our, we are not built yeah. to so bear the weight of somebody in, else's expectations totally. along that line. So way. common in spousal rec, uh, relationships. It is. Yeah. So if you weren't telling me how great I was at all times, every single day, 50 times a day, yeah. I took that as like a negative thing. 
So this is, this is a place where we're growing, and I, I just want to say this too, because I know this is, this is hard. This, these, are, these are hard things to think about, and it's going to get worse probably before we're done, but um, when I find myself reacting um, in these ways of feeling like, oh, I'm being threatened or I'm being criticized, uh, it really is an invitation from the Lord, right? This, this is Him That's drawing us absolutely. to Himself yes. Yes. to bring it to Him, because there's nowhere else for us to go with it, right? Right. We bring it to the Lord. It's an invitation to, you know what, I, I see you. I see you reacting that way. I see you're feeling threatened. I see you're feeling attacked. Yeah. You know, bring it to me. Because um, he's the only one that can really, can really fix it. The next one is when I have to be thanked. When I do things for people and I really just have to have a thank you for it. When really, I mean, and, and thanks are appropriate. It's uh, absolutely and good, good all manners of these but, are are good in yeah. a sense. But when I but when I'm feeling needed. like my my identity is being attacked because someone didn't say thank you to me for whatever it was I yeah. did, yeah. you know this it's it's hard yes. because it's yeah. the right hand left hand like Sim Jesus exactly. addressed that in Matthew. Right? When competition this is the other side of that. When competition becomes an emotional event, what we mean by that is that there's like such a passion. That if I don't win, if I don't get the win, and that can, not just in a game, though, if you haven't seen my dad play games, card oh, games wow. lately, oh, dear Lord, I'm half embarrassed. But um, it's, the... Uh, it's awesome. He's, yeah. you, you just win. You win a lot. You can't help it, right? Yeah, right? That's according to dad. All right. Yeah. Um, it, the difference there is like, I've got to win. And if I don't win, I'm not going to feel good about myself like that's it start or that person I actually envy because they've got it they, they've got it better or things are better for them I don't feel good about myself that's such an indication that there's something going on that when I when I'm upset if someone else is recognized and I'm forgotten mm -hmm. like when that thought emotion comes up in your mind and I'm again we're all prone to it yes Take Jen's advice there. It's like that's an invitation to recognize that's something that is not whole. The throne room piece, the throne is not in the throne room. A um, couple that's more. That's right. Real so, quick. yeah, this, got, this next one. In a way. I, yeah. So, when I overanalyze what people say and do, digging for hidden motives, like there's a prize for it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Over right? Oh, this is good. This, and I, this, this has been me all over the place. What? Over analyzing what people say and do, trying to figure out, okay, do they like me? Do they not like me? Sweetheart, they, I just told you what I meant. <laughs> right. And you're like, yeah, but what yeah. about that? Are Digging sure? for hidden motives. I read this phrase that just stunned me, that what other people think about me is none of my business. So let that <laughs> sit on you for a minute. What other people what do think, think of that? Me, right? Exactly. Oh. I mean, it's changing my life. I mean, what other people think about me I'm is get none. Get your bumper of, sticker. I, you right. know what? That see, that would be an appropriate one. Like, right. stay out of her way. And what you think is yeah. just what other people think about me is none of my business because that's really between them and the Lord. And they got to; those two I, have to deal with that. Absolutely. Like, yeah. So, la last one. I, we could go on and on. Um, the one I want to uh, conclude on that part with. Here's an indication that my, my, the source of my security is not God. When I'm being silent or inactive, when I should be speaking up yeah. and I should be active because I'm intimidated, I'm worried about what other people are gonna think. If I don't follow through, if I do what I think I'm supposed to do and I don't do it, and I, boy, again, this is a huge leadership thing, and, 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 and I'll just speak for men for just a second on this. Men, how many times have we not led in prayer, pulled our family together and had devotions that, or, or shared a very spiritual, like this was God revealing because we're worried we're being like too, too touchy-feely or whatever that, might, whatever that might be going through our mind when like, listen, God spoke to me something and I need to step up. Like, those are opportunities for us to be in this invitation. It's time to not walk in the fear of man, but ultimately in the fear of God. And here's the deal. If we don't let God deal with our insecurities, our insecurities will deal with us. It is danger zone all day long if we allow this to continue to happen. Because at some point, just like in that, uh, the throne room in the picture, we'll look at it one more time in a second. Um, 
Eventually, that throne room is going to get filled up with something. It's going to start getting filled up with, with thoughts that, that start cycling and we start obsessing over things and we start acting in ways that are inconsistent with who we are. So let's go back to this question. What was it we started off with in our last couple minutes here? What is the source of my security? Could, I, could we propose to you this morning that it's not, so, it's, not the, it's not the best way to start the question? It's not what. But really the question that we look at is who? Who is the, the, the source of my security? Who's it going to be? Because either it's the fear of the Lord or it's going to be the fear of man. And for all believers, for all generations, it's always been an invitation of God to fear Him, to fear the Lord. And it, it, it's like, where do we go from here? Like, wow. It is, it is this place that God has invited us to a fresh revelation of who He really is, not what the world says He is. Yes. Because if, if, we're, if we're gut honest with ourselves, y'all, and students, you guys are like, you, you guys are totally exposed to this in the extreme. Most of the conversations about God are very touchy-feely. Like a loving, you know, it just ends with he's a loving God. And he is 100% loving. But he's God. Almighty. All-powerful. All perfect, all Amen. holy, able beyond our understandings, his power and his might. So we're going to offer up. We're going we're to take more time with this next week because I think that our, our sense was that we just need to, we, we're going to just need to cultivate this. And I'm, I'm getting ready to share something that I know I am going to get emails at and I've already like dreaded that, but I'm like, hey, if I'm going to preach it, I'm going to do it. All right. So, but I've, I've, it's fair to say I've, I've read dozens and dozens of scholars, good Christian orthodoxy on the definition of the fear of God. And this is how it is. And I'm not saying any of those are wrong. I'm just saying this is how it's sorted for me. And I believe it's completely consistent with all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. And it might present like this, my suggestion. It is a sense of dread balanced by an abundant assurance of God's greatness and His goodness. Yeah. And, and, the, and the reason, and I, I, here, here's the point. In Christ, talk about that. We, we have an assurance, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna chase that all day long, but I, I, I think we dare forget that even as believers, certainly, if there is anyone at the sound of my voice, hear me on this. Please hear me. If you are not in Christ, that dread point there is so real. It should grip you because it's not something that a preacher standing up here talking about. This is a reality. There is a real and holy God. And there is an eternal judgment Amen. that is defined by whether we see God for who he really is. As the author and finisher. And so there's a... Amen. The holy God that often fires associated with, with God. Why? Because fire burns us up. There is a... There is a dread. So even as believers, check this out. There is space for us that says, wait a second. As I enter into his presence, and I, I sing songs like Revelation that you so beautifully done. We're like stepping in this. There should be this moment. Oh, dear God, if it was not for Jesus Christ, yes, right. I would be completely consumed Amen. right yes, here, right. right now. Yes. Like nothing. I would be nothing. Because here's what I find. With a recognition of the dread, the awesomeness of God, it actually inspires my love for God. That's really right. Because I start recognizing that only a loving God would love me that when the wages of sin is death and I should be burned up, right. it would be only a God that could love this sinner into his presence, right? Yeah. And the moment we sit with that, and here's what starts, and we see it with David. We'll, we'll just chase this. I'm, 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 
I just got to let, let this loose here. It is, it is when we sit and we take that little sense of, oh, dear God, you are so all-consuming. Your wrath, oh, oh, my God. Like, right, the oh, my God thing. Sorry. Students, hear me. The culture is deleting that part of the definition of who God is. That is absolutely what is happening in our culture. Why? Because it's the very thing by which it brings us to our knees and say, God, I need you. I need your grace because if I don't have you right now, I'm not going to be saved. I'm going to be consumed in my sin. But here's, here's what happens when we sit and we and we do like what, um, what a good relationship does. As I sit and I recognize, so sweetheart, like here's what happens with you and I in the relationship. At least I think I speak for both, but definitely for me. When I, whenever there's a frustration or concern in the relationship, it doesn't take me long to just look over and see your beauty and to see the track record of your goodness and your great, like your... You are, oh, so amazing to me. Like, like you're amazing to me. But listen, it's, it's what you said. It pales in comparison to our good and great and wonderful and loving God that is so rich in mercy and beauty and splendor. I say, folks, it should drop us to our knees far more often than it does. And I, my prayer, our prayer this morning is that we start moving. And I'm not talking about just a physical expression of, of physical knees, though I, I could just say I think it could, wouldn't hurt us a little bit to get on our knees, maybe just a little more often than we do before God. But, I'm, but our most point is whether we respond quietly or in a big expression, the point is, we must be gripped by the reality that's of who right. God is. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. It's the beginning where the fear of the Lord starts growing and cultivating in our heart. Because the promise is this, our soul most prospers. Hear me. Our soul most proper, prospers. When the most, when the fear of God is absolutely most present in my thoughts, in my thinking. Folks, check this out. I'll just be specific with y'all. The fear of God is most, when I go to purchase that item that was for my own pleasure, and I realize I haven't tithed to the Lord. I'm just calling it like it is. When I choose to be parting on a Sunday morning when I've made a decision that instead of serving God, and I'm not talking about the, the religious, I've got to be here every Sunday piece, but when, our culture, when the, the culture of the world pulls me and I'm making those decisions, I am shorting myself of the prosperity promised by God. The Proverbs writes, the fear of the Lord leads to what? Wisdom. To death? To life. It, re it promises to life. I love this verse. Anybody like this verse? Read this with me, please. The, sweetheart, lead it. the fear of the Lord leads, leads to, to life, life. And, and whoever, whoever has, has it rests rest satisfied. satisfied. He will not, he will not be visited by, by harm. harm. I'm talking about, folks, listen, check this out. I'm talking about, we are talking, God, shoot, who cares what I, Chris says. Scripture just reminded us that the fear of the Lord, when that is predominant in my life, we are, it, it's not about being content like, like our, um, uh, What's the other word that contends? The boring part. Like, uh, like I'm, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like, it is what it is attitude. Not that. I'm talking about satisfied. That's what he's promised. Who wants that? And then, and then what, what do you do with the verse? Because that's Old Testament. You're like, oh, Chris, we are so New Testament believers. <laughs> yeah, but it's still... The word of God from Genesis to Revelation, right? Like, like to stay the back. So here's what it says in the New Testament. So the church, how they respond. The church in Judea and Samaria, all that, all the, the, the land, had peace and was built up. And walking, how did they, how did they respond? 
They walked in the, the fear, fear of, the Lord. of the Lord. Love that. The the Holy Spirit. They walked, and, and how did it multiply? Because of that reality. That's right. So how do we live in that place? How do we do this? So the fear of the Lord is fully experienced at the cross of Christ. At the cross is the intersection between the overwhelming love of God and his rightful wrath that I richly deserved. The ultimate context for the fear of the Lord in my life is an interaction with the cross. And we, we did it this morning where we took, partook of the, the body and, and blood, the symbols yeah. of Christ's life out for us for our redemption so that we could be saved so that we could be sinners that's, who are made that's holy the gospel yep so if we ever wonder what it cost god to redeem us to himself we look at the cross we see what jesus went through for us and it's like the perfect meeting of love and wrath <laughs> this was all poured out on him instead of on me yes so when we think about communion that we practice it regularly, that the Lord has told us to remember him by doing exactly what we did this morning, that we would bring the reality of his presence into our immediate experience again and again and again, and yes. that every single yes. day we would have a conscious awareness of what he has accomplished for us on the cross. Yes. That because Jesus went to the cross and took all the wrath upon himself and the, the payment for the sin that I could never have paid. I do not have to stand in cowering fear yes. of God any longer, yes. right? That's a confidence. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's love, it's reverence, it's awe, yeah. it's adoration. Because All at the it. cross, there, there is no fear in love. The <laughs> possibility of eternal punishment has been completely removed through the death and resurrection of Christ for those who are in Jesus. Close you with, leave you with the picture one more time. The uh, throne room. Sweetheart, actually, can you, you're, you've got this art thing going on. You can totally <laughs> describe this. But we walked in there, and I, again, I say this. For King Ludlow, he died a tragic really? death, all kinds of sad story there. I mean, it really is. It it's tragic. Sad, yeah. Just really tragic of a man. Clearly very gifted on so many levels. Um, so in one sense, all these millions of people come through this room and what they see is a throne room without a throne. But here's the other thing. There's actually, if we go in for a close-up, here's what actually they ultimately see. And I think it's kind of a redemptive part of the story. Look what's just above where the throne, where King's throne was, would have been. This is the picture. That's right. It's hard. The, the photo doesn't quite do it justice of what we Not experienced when we walked in there. Because that particular day, actually, the chandelier was down for cleaning. So it's completely, there was nothing blocking the view. So we walk into this room, and it's um, kind of like a Byzantine, uh, like uh, Hagia Sophia in, in Turkey was the, um, the inspiration for it. So you can't really see it, but the whole all the walls are lined with that bright blue lapis. It's just stunning, this mm. gorgeous stone. We walk in, and it's, it's gold up on the ceiling, as you can see there. And the first thing that your eye is drawn to is this enormous figure of Jesus. And it was just such a, a profound reminder to us that he, <laughs> even in that place where unknown what, his, what Ludwig's heart was yeah. at his point of death, at some point or other, he had a sense that Jesus was high and lifted up. Above but all the other, above all other Because all those others are the kings, Bavarian kings, The six kings, Bavarian right? kings, right. yeah. And that's, that's the point. So here it is. As we're sitting here today, as you hear my voice, bring the throne back. Bring the throne of God back into the throne room of your heart. And wherever you are in that, and many, much of it is progressive for us as we grow in the fear of the Lord. But there is an aspect that starts with a choice. That choice is today.